the way we have expressed our desires to computers is through a programming language, which is of course also a language. It's written by a human so that a computer can execute it. Now we are flipping that contract. We are starting to converse with our computers in a way that they can execute it. And not just produce this account summary as we were talking about earlier, but also produce once again the programming code. Maybe we won't see this programming code even anymore. Maybe this programming code at some point will be completely uh, under the hood and this will just start to evolve into a way for us to tell computers what we want them to do. And that is a way of automating or supercharging also the job of a developer, of a programmer. Now, I don't know about you, but um, um, so I've been following from my, from my background as well, and, and obviously you have this, uh, similar backgrounds. Um, we've been following natural language processing for quite some years. Um, and for me, the launch of GPT-3, first I thought, well, of ChatGPT, um, I thought, you know, I know this, this, this thing, uh, it's the next new thing. Obviously, it's again, slightly more accurate, slightly better more functionalities, more data being trained on. And, you know, for the first couple of weeks, I just thought, well, um, I'm following the news, but this is just sort of natural, uh, linear evolution of, of what I've learned 10 years ago. Somewhere around uh, Christmas holidays, I actually had some time to uh, get hands on myself. Um, and that's when I tried out uh, ChatGPT for the first time. And that really, really, even though I considered myself an expert on the field, it really blew my mind. And I think if anybody's listening, if you, you, know, if you think you know uh, GPT or, or the, this whole lang large language model uh, revolution, if you think you know it just from reading the news articles, you're, you don't really get it, right? You have to start trying it out. It's like, it's so super easy. It's just make a, a simple open AI account and you get access to the free, uh, free version. It's really impressive to see what it, uh, what it can do. Um, uh, and from a next year perspective, um, uh, I immediately uh, sent this, this example uh, to like a video explaining it and I sent it to our, our executive board. Uh, and they, they're used to, well, they're not used to getting that much from me, but they're, they're used to getting uh, things now and then. And I was repressing them, like, oh, you have to watch this because, you know, this explains actually, like, it, it sort of, this is the momentum. And as a board, you have to, you have to think about this because it could have large consequences for you. Um, uh, and, and I also always got the response, yeah, we know what it is, we saw it as well. And always when I asked, have you tried it? They would say, no, 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 I haven't tried it myself. I hadn't had the chance yet. And I said, well, then you don't know. So people are trying to sort of pretend to be an expert uh, in the first day. I don't know if you recognize that, but yeah, yeah, of course I know, I know, I know. And then you ask sort of a couple of advanced questions, but, but have you tried it? And then they go blank. And then I always feel like, okay, but like I grab my phone and I try to show it to them, like, but it really works. Like it's really impressive. Yeah. And that's when it really sort of clicks. And I think that what you describe, uh, Luke, is something that many recognize, that with ChatGPT being launched late November last year, it was like AI all of a sudden worked, like this immense leap, this big step that was taken in terms of the quality of the output of these models. Um, but actually, if you think about it, the models that are part of this technology have, quote unquote, been invented already five years ago. So five years ago, there was this very influential idea of the transformer network. It was published in a, in a very influential paper by now uh, called Attention is All You Need. And five years ago, this technology, so to, so to speak, as an evolution of all the other uh, neural networks that were there was invented. Um, and along those five years, models were improving and improving and improving. And we could see a little bit of it coming if you followed the field closely. For example, in 2021, there was this big debate with Google around the model Lambda, where there was this one engineer who leaked to the press 
that, wow, we have this model that is self-conscious. Because look at this, I talk to the model and we have this conversation about the model being afraid to be turned off and it has, it has a conscious, it has these same existential fears as we humans do. And that was the first moment where I thought, this is really going places. But at that time, we couldn't try those models ourselves yet. It wasn't exposed to the public. So the big revolution that took place in this journey of five years happened exactly at that moment, late November last year, when OpenAI suddenly opened the floodgates and everybody could try it. And that's when all of a sudden we thought, wow, this big leap has been taken. But in reality, of course, it's a much more incremental process over the last five years. Now, OpenAI opened this to the general public. And right now we can indeed experience the power of this technology. We can indeed see that it is literally generating text, as you say. You can, you can talk to it and it produces this original text. Because for sure, at first you think it's just copying a recipe. But then when you go deeper, you find out that it's actually flexible and it has almost reasoning-like capabilities. Yeah, so if I look at, um, there's, quite, there's been quite some research as well uh, the past uh, six months, also on business schools, not just the, the artificial intelligence corner, let's say. Um, so, so what you're seeing is that uh, predictions around uh, white collar uh, workers, so typical brain, uh, typical uh, tasks around uh, creating emails, creating proposals, brainstorming, um, creating large texts that um, people who are using or who are using this model, and I think it was based on, on the, the, the three one, the, the third one, um, already showed like 35% efficiency in those tasks. That's like huge, right? I don't know about your job, but if I can save 35%, that's like 14 hours in a week. That's almost two days. That, that's so incredibly powerful. If you have a, a large group of uh, customer service agents, if you have a large or even just like text writers or uh, um, copywriters. Like there's so much tasks that they are doing that this suddenly makes so much faster that there's this whole productivity um, uh, chance. Uh, I think it was um, um, GitHub coming with the uh, Copilot function uh, originally, uh, also based I think on the GPT-3 one or, or even before that, um, which showed like 55% uh, speed in programming in and, and it's not perfect right it doesn't just create 55 percent of your task now it, it it attempts to create let's say 100 percent but you still have to edit it right so all the time is saved on maybe generating for the first time the text uh, but it does take some time to then edit it and uh, adjust it um, yeah what we've learned, at least at Next few, we're, we're applying it ourselves as well. Especially, we see uh, a big adoption in the um, um, the business consultancy in the um, uh, product owner area, where there's a lot of communication-based tasks, where there's a lot of user story generation that you want to have in a certain format. That that this really speeds up. Uh, we also notice that you want to do this for tasks that you are yourself an expert in because you have to be able to assess if it's true, if it's not hallucinating, like you mentioned earlier, um, uh, or if it's actually, you know, uh, just uh, echoing the, the wrong trained data, because it's basically an echo chamber, right? Um, and that's how we use it. Obviously, we use it in a way that um, uh, is always, uh, we align this with our customers, right? So our customers are basically determining if our consultants are allowed to use it. We, we're signing also, obviously, um, uh, data processing agreements with uh, with clients. Uh, we have to do a lot with uh, intellectual property. We have a lot to do with confidentiality. So we, we don't do these things uh, on our own, but uh, especially with our most innovative customers, we're really working together on actually making the implementation team uh, also enabled by GPT. Uh, and I think what we, we're seeing, especially speed in, in, in user stories and in, in documentation, in um, um, generating a lot of test scripts to like, test the functionality and, and it's, it's performing very good. It's, it really speeds up. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it speeds up like 10%, uh, 20% on, on those tasks already. And if you, if you do that for a big implementation team, you know, there's a lot of speed and there's a lot of additional value that you can then deliver as a, as a team. Uh, maybe it's um, an idea to 
talk a bit about uh, Einstein GPT in, in, let's say, sense of a specific business domain. Uh, obviously CRM, right? So your new slogan, CRM plus data plus AI. Um, I love it because uh, uh, next year we cover all three uh, in the same teams. So in the same people even. So that's really, really nice that it sort of leads into that, uh, that direction. Um, but CRM mostly used, mostly known as well in the sales domain. Uh, how is Einstein GPT helping sales teams? Yeah, absolutely. So there are various angles where, where that is taking place right now. So the first and the most obvious one is along the lines that you already described also for your own teams, meaning um, towards the productivity of the employee, towards the productivity of the sales rep, uh, in this case, for example, or the sales manager. And if you think about it, it's fascinating actually to realize that the types of use cases and the types of jobs that are affected by uh, this generative or this artificial intelligence technology, the way we look at it has completely shifted. If we were to go back 10 years in time, we thought that the first jobs to be affected by machine learning and artificial intelligence were the very physical jobs. like Blue collar. Blue collar, like driving a taxi, driving a truck, factory workers. And then there was, you know, on a little bit longer horizon, maybe we thought back then we would be touching the cognitive work, like maybe software engineers and lawyers. And then at the very last stage, we said to ourselves, it's going to be the creative professions, the writers, the graphic designers. Today, that has completely reversed. Because if I look outside, I don't see those self-driving taxis yet. Maybe if I go to Phoenix, I will see a few <laughs> one driving there. But it's not at scale that we see those jobs being affected. The first ones that are truly affected now are, in fact, the ones that we thought was going to be affected last, which are those creative positions. So the writing positions, the graphic designers. And more and more, we see also these cognitive jobs now being affected. And I say affected, but I actually mean in a positive way, being reinforced, augmented by this technology. Uh, again, indeed, the software engineers, the people in your implementation teams, the developers but also the salespeople indeed. The salespeople who now have this technology at their fingertips for writing messages, for starting to draft emails. And sure, they will edit those emails and they will interact with the technology to ask, for example, hey, can you write this email in a less formal way? Or can you also include this particular section that you missed out uh, at first and I also want it to be included in the email? So it's this iterative process of working with the technology rather than typing the whole email for you from scratch. So it's basically what you're explaining, um, Einstein GPT for sales is sort of as a virtual assistant or a maybe a virtual intern <laughs> that you could actually ask and that you could give additional instructions and that you have this dialogue to work together on the same deliverable, let's say an email or um, uh, a proposal or something in the line of that. Absolutely, yeah, I like this idea of the virtual intern. I think that's a, that's a good way to describe it. <laughs> They're also sometimes wrong. <laughs> they can be wrong too, yeah, they need to be trained. Let's blame the intern. <laughs> they need to be trained, they need to get better at what they do. Um, but yeah, something like you start to work on a new account, for example, you, you, yeah, the territory has been reshuffled, you get this new set of accounts to work on as a salesperson, and you start to get familiar with these accounts. You can ask Einstein GPT to write an account summary for you. What is going on in this account? And then what it will do, it will combine public data about that account, what's happening. Maybe it will look through annual reports or it will, you know, spy on the public website. And it will combine that with the data that your company owns already about this customer. What kind of interactions have you had before with this customer? And what deals have your predecessors closed with this customer? It combines that data and it provides this account summary to you. This is what's going on in the account that you have now been assigned to. And that gives you this immense kickstart to start engaging with this customer, which would otherwise, indeed, that's why I like your example, perhaps be the work of an intern. Can you pr produce this report for me as to what account I have inherited? It's interesting, right? That we may be automating interns. Uh. <laughs> or maybe it's the interns that will review the summaries, exactly. edit them and pass them on to the more senior colleagues. So the Einstein GPT for sales, um, basically what you're explaining is sort of a market research and an account research uh, that, that you're asking to do. So it, it is connected to the internet. It is connected to those uh, public data sources. It will be able to leverage all sorts of data sources, absolutely. Yeah. And can I steer in that already? Or is that sort of um, 
does it determine it, it itself, let's say? Does it predict which sources is, are relevant for your, your question? In the conversation that you have with these agents, like I said, it's an iterative process, very much like the way we have started to use ChatGPT now. The first response is probably not what you expect out of it. But rather than immediately editing it, you edit it through conversing with the system once again. So that's how you can steer it. So again, when we, we think back of what, what Michaela was also saying, that um, the rough drafting of the text, that's like, that speeds it up. And then the fine tuning, there's going to be some additional time compared to the old situation. But in total, you're actually going to um, make it faster to, to generate these texts. Absolutely. This is going to be a huge time saver. I'm absolutely uh, convinced of that. Yeah. yeah. Do you already, because it's in pilot now, and I know you can't say a lot about it, but are there any maybe results or maybe lookouts that you could could talk about? Like, are you seeing also these, these efficiencies already uh, being actually, uh, these business cases being provided being it is indeed this massive time saver and not just for the salespeople. you were talking earlier about uh, your implementation teams and, yeah. and also for developers right we are integrating it also in development environments and that is absolutely fascinating to think about it i believe because we're talking here about language it's called a large language model for a reason but we are now conversing in natural language um, the way we have expressed our desires to computers is through a programming language, which is of course also a language. It's written by a human so that a computer can execute it. Now we are flipping that contract. We are starting to converse with our computers in a way that they can execute it. And not just produce this account summary as we were talking about earlier, but also produce once again the programming code. Maybe we won't see this programming code even anymore. Maybe this programming code at some point will be completely uh, under the hood and this will just start to evolve into a way for us to tell computers what we want them to do. And that is a way of automating or supercharging also the job of a developer, of a programmer. Because now through natural language, we can tell the computer what it needs to do. And we can create new computer programs through natural language. And that, I think, by itself is such a massive accelerator. We humans have a very bad intuition for exponential growth. When we think about evolution and innovation, we tend to think linearly. We look back five years, we analyze how much innovation there was, and then we expect that same amount of innovation to come the coming five years, which is completely wrong, of course, because more innovation drives, again, more innovation. And therefore, this curve is exponential. But this curve is sort of mega super hyper exponential <laughs> now that all of a sudden we can create programming code which is at the source of so much innovation through natural language and that by itself i think is going to lead to a situation where in maybe 20 years from now we don't even recognize the world that we live in from the world that we have today it's going to be completely different it's going to be difficult then to steer your business towards goals that you cannot predict right it's going to be increasingly important to be agile and readjust the course of your business uh, at a very quick pace. So and if we talk about the, the sales domain, the commercial domain, uh, what would you think or what would you advise those, those sales leaders to, uh, to start planning for, to start thinking about or to, to initiate? I think what sales leaders should start to uh, plan for right now is think about how and which areas of their sales teams are in need of this supercharged uh, productivity. Because as much as we would like this technology to be available with the flip of a switch, we know that it's not the case. Even though this technology is so powerful, the devil is in the details and setting up Einstein GPT or like-minded technologies for your sales department are going to require configuration and some implementation and thinking through and planning. And therefore, I think that right now, there is this window of opportunity for sales leaders to think about where to start and where they believe the largest benefits lie for their particular organization. And this is different from one organization to another. There is no one size fits all answer for this. Can you give me an example maybe of two completely different ways to address this, this, uh, this innovation? Well, for example, it may be a very different approach that you take when you are trying
trying to supercharge your new business organization, your hunting sales organization versus your account management organization, your customer success organization, your farming organization. And these require also different data sources. These require different types of fine tuning of the models and different types of grounding of the models to work with. And that idea of identifying where your uh, opportunities lie and what data sources you need to make this work, that is not going to go away. Because an off-the-shelf large language model like we know from ChatGPT isn't going to be the only answer to your needs here. You will need to combine that once again with curated data sources, your own data sources or other public data sources that you trust and that you connect into. And that thinking is what needs to happen now. It sounds a bit like you're explaining a world not just with one, let's say, super AI, knowing everything, being trained on everything, being good at everything, but more of a niche or specialist AI agents that are specialized in one particular task, but are completely grounded and uh, um, uh, trustworthy for that specific task. Absolutely. And the beauty of this revolution is that one thing that has always been extremely difficult is now a whole lot easier. And I'm talking about combining your private data with public data. That has always been a massive challenge. But now, as we resort to language, language is language, whether it's your personal data or your private data. So the combination of these data sources now all of a sudden can be so much more unstructured. And that is a large benefit and time saver in crossing this chasm between the public data and the private data. So the planning that those sales executives need to do is indeed a creative one. It is one around thinking through these data sources, but gluing them together is through the magic of language and through the semantic grammar that is in language, which is shared among those data sources. So it sounds a lot about that part of your strategy, your sales strategy, but it, I think it can be applied to basically all domains uh, to already start thinking about the selection of data that you need, the selection of knowledge or content that you want to have included in your model and to make sure that is of proper quality, that is vetted, that it's confirmed so that you have uh, the ability to train a model on, on that trustworthy data. Absolutely. So cleaning, data cleaning, I know it's really boring, everybody hates it, but data cleaning would be definitely, and data quality management and, and data, master data management and, and topics like that will actually be maybe core to your, your fundamentals now to be able to actually unlock those large language models later on. Absolutely. Even though the topic of data cleaning gets a whole new facelift as well, because we're used to cleaning structured data. Now all of a sudden we have to think about the cleaning of text corpora, which is a whole different ballgame. And, and probably for the structured data, you can actually automate parts of that as well with a large language model. <laughs> I can imagine it already takes out spelling mistakes by... Uh, <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I think there are a couple of ways that we can, can go from here. Um, one is what we didn't really touch yet are our limitations. There is something to say there because I'm not sure if you tried uh, to have ChatGPT add two numbers, but it usually gets it wrong. <laughs> yeah. So how can it that this is still helping analytics? I think that's interesting to unpack. Uh, the second one is what are boundaries of, of what you can do with a large language model and where do we still need traditional ML models. So I think that is somewhat a, a limitation discussion. But let's, let's pick that first one and just go with that one first and then okay. let's see where it, uh, it takes us. Uh, and I okay. think actually it links back a lot to, you know, when I tried um, different tasks with, with GPT in the beginning, right? Um, uh, I already mentioned the, um, the example of a, a recipe and I, um, um, I, I think I already gave the example of planning my trip right um, but yeah indeed when I actually within that trip I was uh, also asking for uh, what is the estimated price of each of those nice activities and indeed sum them up and it completely failed um, and uh, I tried to correct it like I said but you're wrong it's, it's this and it, it sort of gave me like it, yeah you're right uh, sorry it, it immediately apologized it's almost like a very servant uh, uh, chatbot um, but yeah in mathematical skills it, it completely failed so can one of you maybe talk a bit about uh, 
how that's possible or what kind of limitations we, we have to consider. I mean, it's got a large language model for a reason, right? It has been trained on language and the result is a model. And if you think about the word model, a model is by definition an approximation of the reality, right? So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is this model ready to answer the questions that I have for it? Or maybe the approximation is too rough in that particular domain because we can never model the whole universe. Right? The whole universe is only modeled by the universe itself, but it's quite unpractical to run the universe because the only way to run the universe is by letting the universe run itself. So therefore we are approximating and a large language model approximates through language. And that is where it gets its knowledge from and its reasoning abilities. So the question is almost, why would it be able to calculate? Is calculus and computation something that is enclosed in the semantical grammar of language? And that's pretty philosophical actually, but I think that it is not the case. There is a different kind of cognitive ability that provides us with computation uh, rather than just language. And that is also why I think that currently as these models are trained on language, it fails in, as you said, summarizing the costs of your trip. Now that doesn't mean that these models are useless in analytical contexts. It just means that you need to deploy and use them differently. Because what you can very well use them for is ask a question, like you said, what is the summary or uh, what is the summation of these costs of the trip? But then you need to indeed provide also the structure with it. You need to provide the structure, the metadata of how your data is structured. And what the system can then do is come back to you with a query, with a SQL query. We're back to programming again. You ask an analytical question, you give it the structure of your data tables, and what it comes back with is a query that would actually give you the answer. So the model isn't going to give you the answer to your question. It's going to give you a query that will lead to the answer. Then what is stopping you from automating this and firing the query into the database so that the database gives you the answer? And the only thing that the large language model then did is translate your natural language question into a SQL query. You fire the query, you get the response. And hey, while you're at it, why not translate the response again in natural language. So then you have still automated the whole loop, but the true analytical calculation is still outsourced to a database. And there's nothing wrong with that. So the solution I believe to conversational analytics lies in large language models, but in combination with techniques that we have already out there. And it's quite dangerous to now see these large language models as the solution to everything. I think they are truly powerful if we combine them with the things that we have already mastered. So Einstein GPT can do math. Einstein GPT will be able to do math in conjunction with all those other technologies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> Good. Um, so when we, so math is just one one of those topics, right? That that is seen as a limitation. Um, we also already talked a bit about how. The, the database and, and that it was trained on uh, actually also determines a lot about the outcome. Uh, I can imagine that uh, having bias in your data set, um, having, um, uh, is, is actually that having bias in your data set actually sort of also leads to a biased answer or a biased uh, uh, response from, from GPT. Um, how, like, how do you handle that? Like, how do you handle these other limitations and maybe even ethics? Yeah, that's a great question too, because it is super important, right? And part of it comes from what data it was trained on, and part of it comes from how was it then fine-tuned and you know taught to behave. Uh, and if we tackle the first one first, like what data was it trained on? Um, again, we're talking about language here. Suppose that you're, we're sitting here at a table, right? We're sitting here at a table and we can ask a model, yeah, what is the weight of this table? how would it know what the weight of this table is? Because we're just asking for the weight of the table. Now through language, we can say, ah, but wait a minute, this is a table made out of recycled uh, materials, recycled plastics, uh, and actually it's an oval shape and there are eight people who can sit here at this table. Then it has something more to work with. We have extended the model that we have enclosed in this, in this language, in this natural language question. 
perhaps now the model can come up with a uh, weight of the table. If it so happens that there has been a piece of text that it was trained on where a similar question was answered. We don't know quite yet if it's able to extrapolate that all of a sudden maybe it was trained on a table for six people and we're asking about a table for eight people. We don't quite know yet if the model will by itself be able to do that extrapolation and add a little bit of additional weight. Of course, what would really be helpful is if we can give true dimensions and measurements and actually have once again a calculus module. So I'm using this example to stress the fact that the large language model will be working best in conjunction also with other machine learning models. For example, a classical normal standard regression model that based on the features of this table is able to do this extrapolation job and is able to provide us with the weight of this table. Now, why am I giving this explanation as answer in a question around bias? Because that's also part of bias. Part of bias is also how are you able to extrapolate and how are you able to get accurate results on questions that you are asking and how does that relate to the training data that it was trained on. So this is very important. Be able to define it that training data is wide enough and also combine it with additional machine learning techniques so that it will be able to give those answers. But then a second question that you ask is around um, harmful output and how do we make it behave, right? Which is what we often associate to the concept of bias. And there it is our responsibility as Salesforce to provide you with technology that allows you to train models in such a way that it aligns with your corporate values, with your company values. Because the truth is, bias and prejudices and uh, what is just and what is unjust isn't something that as a society we are very good at defining or agreeing with. And indeed it's diverse. There it's are definitely uh, changes of mind on that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, in the United States, they still haven't agreed on who was actually elected. So who is to say what was true? Who is to say what is just? Therefore, it is a joint responsibility to train these models in such a way that they comply with the values that you uphold. So and how are you going to do that? Then? And hence, we will indeed provide you with technology that allows you to do this reinforcement learning through human feedback. We will allow you to grade the responses and the outputs of these models according to the values that you uphold and the principles that you find important and run into this iterative improvement loop so that the models will start to reflect those values. So we will provide you with toxicity controls and toxicity training technology. What is to toxicity? Can you explain a bit? Toxicity is the level with which those models output a what we call toxic reply, a reply that we consider harmful, that we consider uh, non-behaving well, rude, discriminatory, a reply that is just not acceptable for ethical reasons. How do you how do you measure that? How do you go about that? So um, you're gonna uh, like how does an implementation how would an implementation look like uh, from Einstein GPT? Like where where is the work in in such an implementation? I can give you an example of how some other models have been trained in this regard. We have been speaking a lot about OpenAI and ChatGPT and, and GPT-3 and its evolution into GPT-4. But of course, in this whole trajectory of five years development of large language models, there have been many, many more language models. And one of them is coming from Google, for example. We now know a lot about BARD. But Google has also been working on Sparrow. Sparrow, which originated from Chinchilla. And there it was literally a process of raising Chinchilla, an existing model, into Sparrow to behave well. What they did is define a set of principles, 23 rules that all these outputs needed to comply with. And they started to grade each output according to these 23 rules. Is it harmful? Is it uh, accurate? Is it uh, relevant? And across those type of high level categories, they had some more fine grain rules. So we will be able, you will be able to do this same uh, exercise to grade outputs according to such rules once again, that align with values that you uphold in a way of retraining those models. And as, as Salesforce, I assume that uh, to some level Einstein GPT is already trained, pre-trained. You wanted to talk about um, the basic principles that yep. you develop, that you use for responsible AI. 
So Einstein GPT will come with pre-trained models that of course uphold already many principles that we as Salesforce hold near and dear to your heart and to our heart. You don't need to start from scratch like Google needed to do with raising Chinchilla into Sparrow. Of course, those models are reflecting what we generally would accept as common sense behaviors. But our um, guidelines for responsible AI development go much beyond that. We actually have listed five principles that we find important when it comes to developing AI responsibly. And that's a joint responsibility. And the first one is around accuracy, which was one of those rules that um, I spoke about earlier in the grading of the output. But it also means that once we consume these model outputs, we need to be transparent about the certainty and the truthfulness. Are we actually sure that what the model is saying is accurate? Or can there be some uncertainty about that truthfulness? And that openness is very important, which can be achieved, for example, through citing the sources. What sources had the model used or at its disposal to come up with this response or provide a chain of thought? What was the chain of reasoning that the model went through? There are ways to solicit that from the model or even to highlight some specific areas in the response that are recommended to verify. This is what comes out of the model. But hey, by the way, that little fact over there, you may want to double check that before you take it for granted, which is not what we're seeing yet in, for example, ChatGPT. But when we bring this technology to our enterprises, those are the things that start to matter greatly. And like that, there are four more principles that we hold near and dear to our heart. You want to talk about all of them or? By all means. Which, which one? <laughs> we have time, don't we? <laughs> Some other principles, for example, an important one is around sustainability. It's called a large language model. And large means that it's very costly to serve costly to run. And here I'm not speaking about the financial cost, but about the environmental cost. Because not just the training, but also the usage of these models in producing the outputs consumes a lot of electricity. And thereby the carbon footprint is very high. But then the question is, do we always need large language models? Or can we make them actually smaller? Can we make them more purposeful and smaller in size so that they simply consume less electricity to run? which is completely in line with our sustainability value as, as Salesforce as a whole. Um, honesty is another one. Do you have actually the permission to train the model on the data that you're training it on? Is that data uh, really something that you can use for training? But also honesty in the sense of being transparent that a particular piece of content has been created by an engine and not by a human. Just stated out loud, this was a generated piece of context, is around honesty, right? Safety around doing every effort to control the bias and the harmful output as we, as we just talked about. And finally also empowerment, because a lot of these things are about automating processes. And use case by use case, we need to identify the right balance in, are we gonna put a human in the loop? Are we gonna automate the human altogether? Where is that balance for this use case? So that empowerment is a very important value too, which is, I think, something that you need to design for every use case from the start. As soon as you start thinking about a use case, it's about the empowerment of the human and how much human involvement in the loop is there. Who's going to be the, um, the decider for such a thing in a corporate environment? I think that's a joint responsibility of the of the company that's implementing the technology together with its ecosystem of partners that's doing so. I think there is, as this technology is relatively new, I think there's an important role for organizations like NextView to advise customers on these principles and to make sure that from the project design already, those principles are front and center. And I think that therefore it's a dialogue that you need to have with the key stakeholders of the organization and the key stakeholders of the project implementation to start with that. We're here in the, in the design thinking center. It should be part of the ultimate design, I believe. Yeah, that's also obviously how we work, right? So whether it's a CRM implementation or an AI implementation, getting different stakeholders together, getting different points of views together and, and letting an, an organization align around this, a common topic, a common understanding of what they're trying to achieve uh, is, is yeah core to our, uh, our business. We, we always put that 
uh, human-centered or user-centered uh, approach. So when you talk about human in the loop and when you talk about um, uh, not optimizing the full human out of the process, but rather use it as an empowerment and a productivity tool for that, that human, I think that's really important uh, uh, principles that we, we completely share uh, among the, the five that you mentioned already. Um, I'm just curious a bit about um, the, the, the first principle you talked about, uh, about also sort of giving transparency and reasoning and being self-critical. And is that something that you sort of saw happening in, in the community already that, I mean, I can imagine um, uh, AutoGPT, I don't know if you tried it, but AutoGPT uh, is basically an, an, a GPT version that is able, that, that is programmed in a way that you give it a task and that actually ha does have the uh, ability to create an own sort of sub-agent um, uh, to perform the task. One of the things that I com saw immediately was that it already stated, okay, hey, this is what I understood from your query. Um, this is planning my next task. So it gives a change of chain of thought to it, but it also uh, always did a self-criticism prompt, right? Okay, if you got this task, if you got this plan, it basically prompted itself to generate what do I need to look at, be careful about? What do I like? Uh, where could it go wrong? And providing that already back to the end user is that what you talk about when you talk about that first principle? I think that's a very very promising uh, um, direction uh, that these uh, technologies can can take. It divides the problem into sub problems and organizes a organization layer around all these sub problems to ultimately combine the various outputs once again to something consistent. And that is by itself, uh, I think, a very um, promising and also scary development. <laughs> but the good thing is that it gave us also the ideas of indeed self-criticism, because that's part of this divide and conquer process. All of a sudden, we can indeed let the model criticize itself, because that's one of those subtasks. And this is, again, a good thing, because now it allows us to uphold this value of accuracy and honesty much better. It's really interesting to hear that you're also like tapping into, let's say, the more open innovation. So right now we're in the phase of large language models, but I think very soon we will see much smaller models emerging that behave very, very similarly. 